Hello and welcome back everyone to Grockets OG TV. This is the GMAT edition, like it says in the lower corner of the screen once my mouse kind of unfreezes. There we go. Uh-oh. Come on. You can do it, little mouse. Uh-oh. Well, we'll see if it calms down in a second here. Anyway, um, this is the uh, OG TV edition where we go through the official guide to the uh, GMAT, the 12th edition to the guide right here. <clears throat> and sorry about the technical difficulties. My computer seems to be doing some kind of background process right now, so it's making everything a little bit uh, jerky. Well, anyway, all right, it seems like it's a little bit better now. So my name's Jim Jacobson, like it says in the upper right. And when we left off last time, we were in the middle of a reading comprehension passage with a lot of questions, one about snakes. So we are going to pick up where we left off. We finished with question number 20, uh, but I want to briefly rewrite the notes that I had down on this passage um, about snakes. So we had, um, uh, you know what, I'm just, let's just not bother. Let's just uh, move on to the actual questions. I can just refer back to the passage by flipping the page, as can you. So we're actually going to be on page 368, and we're on question number 21. So the author describes the behavior of the circulatory system of sea snakes when they are removed from the ocean, sea lines 17 to 20, primarily in order to what? So when they give you something like this, where they basically gift wrap for you the uh, location of the reference, it is always in your best interest to um, go back and double check. So line 17 to 20, um, let's see. When removed from the water and tilted at various angles with the head up, however, blood pressure at their midpoint drops significantly and at brain level falls to zero. So the reason the author mentions that, um, so that's in the context of describing what happens to uh, sea snakes when they're taken outside of their environment. Um, and so uh, that's, that's opposed to what happens to terrestrial snakes, I guess. So let's see, let's look for an answer choice that um, highlights the contrast between uh, what happens with sea snakes and their specialized circulatory system and some, and some other creatures. So A, illustrate what would occur in the circulatory system of terrestrial snakes without adaptations that enable them to regulate their blood pressure in vertical orientations. Hmm. Well, that, that's certainly a possibility because, um, you know, the, with the whole business with the snake's hearts being in a different place, uh, it could well happen to them if they had their hearts closer to the center of their bodies. So let's, uh, let's keep that one. I'm still a little bit worried about how kind of jerky the mouse is here. Anyway, so I apologize in advance for any, any of my writing that ends up being a little bit messier than usual. Okay, so B, explain why arboreal snakes in vertical orientations must rely on muscle contractions to restore blood pressure to the brain. Um, the restoring blood pressure and the, you know, the muscle contractions things, that was, uh, that does occur at the end of the, um, At the end of the, at the end of the passage lines, uh, you know, forty or so, but it's not necessarily restoring blood to the brain. It's actually restoring blood just kind of to the middle, getting it from the tail to the heart. So this is this is definitely not it. Uh, C. Illustrate the effects of circulatory failure on the behavior of arboreal snakes. Um, we don't find out anything about circulatory failure in the tree snakes. It's just that this is what happens to sea snakes. Uh, D. Illustrate the superiority of the circulatory system of the terrestrial snake to that of the sea snake. You know, if you don't take them out of the water and tilt them up, uh, sea snakes are just fine. And uh, since sea snakes don't really make a point of going out of the water, there's no superiority. In fact, it may actually even be better. Um, the sea snakes may even have a better system, at least as far as their environment is concerned. And then choice E. Explain how changes in spatial orientation can adversely affect the circulatory system of snakes with hearts located in relatively close proximity to their heads. Um, so remember, the sea snakes have their hearts in the middle, not close to their heads. Um, and so that doesn't really show anything about how, um, you know, turning them so that their head is up or whatever. Um, it, it, it doesn't illustrate anything about uh, snakes with their hearts in a different place. So 
Choice A originally, uh, so showing what happens, you know, to sea snakes highlights what doesn't happen to, to terrestrial or arboreal snakes. So it is, in fact, answer choice A. That's a check mark. I'm going to write over these so that if I, well, I guess I'm not really going to end up keep, keeping notes since I don't have the notes on the passage on this one. Anyway, question number 22. It can be inferred from the passage that which of the following is a true statement about sea snakes. So it's an inference question, so what we're looking for is not actually stated in the passage, but it is something that uh, will be supported by text in the passage. Uh, the clue that we're given in this question is that it's on the section on sea snakes, which is primarily the second paragraph, um, where we find out about you know, what they have, these various aspects of their circulatory system. So, uh, but until we actually get to the answer choices, there's not a lot of prediction that we can do. Answer choice A, they frequently rely on waves of muscle contractions from the lower torso to the head to supplement the work of the heart. I mean, I suppose that could be true, but that would be outside knowledge. I don't actually know that much about sea snakes. The whole thing with waves of muscle contractions is actually the tree snakes. So um, that's not what we can infer for sea snakes. Uh, B, they cannot effectively regulate their blood pressure when placed in seawater and tilted at an angle with the head pointed downward. That's super not true. In fact, it actually implies that they're fine in any direction as long as they're in the water. So um, tilting them with head downward um, does not appear to be a problem. Uh, C, they are more likely to have a heart located in close proximity to their heads than our arboreal snakes. Again, this is another... This is a 180, um, or you know, it's they have it completely switched around, as was the case with A up here. Um, it's actually the tree snakes that have the heart as close as 15% of the distance or something uh, from the head to the heart. So that's um, wrong snake. Uh, choice D, they become uh, acutely vulnerable to the effects of gravitational pressure on their circulatory system when they are placed in a terrestrial environment. Terrestrial just means on land, and that's actually what the what passage uh, paragraph two actually talked a lot about is what happens when you take a sea snake out and do stuff to it outside of its uh, environment with the pressure gradients being equal around all sides because of the water. So take the take the water snake out of the water, it has problems, and um, that's pretty likely. Let's just double check E. Sea snakes, um, their cardiovascular system is not as complicated as that as arboreal snakes. There's nothing that, that supports that. Uh, in fact, it sounds like they have more or less all the same parts, you know, hearts and veins and blood and muscles and stuff. It's just in a different orientation, and uh, that makes all the difference. So definitely not E. So answer choice D for number 22. So page 368, number 23. The author suggests that which of the following is a disadvantage that results from the location of a snake's heart in close proximity to its head. So uh, we find out about this. So this is a, when it says the author suggests, that's another inference question, something that is uh, that we can infer from the passage, but it's not actually stated. We find out about snakes with the heart close to the head in the last paragraph, paragraph three, when we find out about tree snakes and how they're so often vertical that they really need to have their heart close to their head so they don't lose the circulation to their brains. Um, and we don't find out uh, a lot. Uh, what it does say is that um, having that location requires that blood circulated to the tail of the snake travel a greater distance back to the heart, a problem solved by another adaptation, which is that, that wiggling that you know pushes the blood back um, towards the heart. So... Um, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, so, dis so the disadvantage is uh, it's stated in the passage that uh, the blood has further to go in the back, ha back part of the snake. So um, let's see, look for an answer that uh, lists something like that as a disadvantage. Choice A, a decrease in the efficiency with which the snake regulates the flow of blood to the brain. If anything, it's more efficient because the distance from the heart to the brain is really short. We're looking for something that's about the brain or the heart to the tail. So it's not going to be answer choice A. 
uh, be a decrease in the number of orientations in space that a snake can assume without loss of blood flow to the brain. Again, with that heart closer to the head, um, it sounds like actually the snake would generally be okay in most orientations. Um, it's getting the blood out of the rest of its body that it's got problems with. Um, C, a decrease in blood pressure at the snake's midpoint when it is tilted at various angles with its head up. Well, you know, that's a little bit closer. If its, if it's heart it's clo is closer to its head, then the midpoint is to the rear of the heart. Um, but there's really nothing in the passage anywhere about the midpoint needing uh, circulation in a way different from the rest. I mean, I guess the sea snakes have their heart in their midpoint, but then they specifically talk about the heart, which is the thing that does the pumping, so it generally doesn't have a problem getting, you know, uh, circulation there. It is the circulation there. Anyway, <clears throat> so it's not uh, C. Uh, D, an increase in the tendency of blood to pool at the snake's head when the snake is tilted at various angles with its head down. Again, with the heart right there, so close to the head, um, that's really not supported by the passage. What we found out is that blood tended to pool closer to the tail, um, even when it's just kind of going along straight. So it's not D. So process of elimination gets us to E. If you were in a hurry on the GMAT, you could just you know, check E and move on. Um, if you're not in a hurry, double check to make sure you didn't miss something obvious. So E, an increase in the amount of effort required to distribute blood to and from the snake's tail. So that sounds a lot like what we, a lot more like what we had predicted, that there would be something um, about blood gathering in the tail. And because then, you know, we did find out that there's this extra effort that the snake has to go to. It does this wiggling motion to kind of push blood back up towards the heart. So uh, answer choice E is the one. Okay, 368, question number 24. The primary purpose of the third paragraph is to... Okay, so we should go back and refresh our memory. Um, the third paragraph talks about how the hearts are in a different position. Um, that sea snakes have the heart closer to the middle of the body, and that the terrestrial snakes, especially the arboreal or tree snakes, are much more likely to have the heart closer to the head, uh, which is a factor in being in more vertical orientations. So the, uh, the third paragraph is about the comparison of these two circulatory systems, um, especially regarding the tree snakes. So, um, is that choice A, introduce a topic that is not discussed earlier in the passage? No, I mean, we do hear about, um, you know, different circulation and stuff like that throughout the whole passage, so there's not really anything new in answer choice A. Um, B, describe a more efficient method of achieving an effect discussed in the previous paragraph. No. <laughs> the uh, Well, you know, I guess it's more efficient for terrestrial snakes to have their heart closer to the middle, but it's not a more efficient method. It's just more efficient method for that particular snake, whereas sea snakes obviously have the more efficient method for themselves. Their methods are equally efficient for their respective snaky lives. Anyway, not that. Uh, C, draw a conclusion based on information elaborated in the previous paragraph. Well, the previous paragraph was about sea snakes, and we're about to hear about tree snakes, so really um, there's not a conclusion being drawn, we're just kind of highlighting uh, a contrast. So D, discuss two specific examples of a phenomena of a phenomena, oh my, I can't believe I just said that. that. It would be phenomenon, right? So anyway, discuss two specific examples of phenomena mentioned at the end of the previous paragraph. Well, the end of the previous paragraph said that, that many terrestrial snakes in similar spatial orientations do not experience this kind of circulatory failure suggests that certain adaptations enable them to regulate blood pressure more effectively in those orientations. That specific example being uh, of uh, adaptations, the location of the heart. So actually that sounds pretty good. E though says, introduce evidence that undermines a view reported in earlier in the passage. No, I mean, there's... There's no undermining of anything, really. So definitely choice D. We had predicted that it was um, something about the two snakes. This is 
actually the only answer choice that even has the word to, not that it had to have the word to, but that's one of our hints that we are on the right track. And a review of what happened at the end of the previous paragraph backs up this, um, this idea that it is a discussion of two specific, two specific examples of something at the end of the previous paragraph. So answer choice D. Last snake question. Now we're on page 369. Number 25. In the passage, the author is primarily concerned with doing which of the following. So this is kind of an author's uh, tone or purpose. It's somewhat a main idea question. We did, um, did we have a main idea passage question? Nope. So this is more like our main idea question. And uh, so the passage as a whole, the author is doing some explaining, um, just going down the list of the um, the main verbs, the, 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 the vertical scan of the different uh, answer choices, A has explaining, B has comparing, C has explaining, D has pointing out features, and E has explaining. So nothing we can eliminate just on the basis of those initial answers. A lot of times with main idea questions, you can knock things out based on those initial answer choices. If there had been um, an answer choice that started with the word advocating or arguing, we probably could eliminate it because um, the author isn't trying to say that one thing is better than another or that a particular course of action should be adopted. It's uh, really just talking about snakes and their circulation. Reading comprehension is so educational. Anyway, so we need something that captures the author's primary purpose, which is kind of comparing um, an issue, uh, different evolutionary adaptations to a particular issue, maybe. Um, I don't know. Let's take a look at the answers. A, explaining adaptations that enable the terrestrial snake to cope with the effects of gravitational pressure on its circulatory system. Well, okay, that's 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 all right. Let's just uh, keep an eye on that one and move on. Uh, B, comparing the circulatory system of the sea snake with that of the terrestrial snake. So there is a little bit of contrast and comparing between the two, but the author is not primarily concerned with that. It's more about adaptation and how the one type of creature could be, you know, how the different creatures have adapted differently for their different environments. So um, while circulation, different circulatory systems of different snakes is, are mentioned, I don't think that comparing the systems is the primary goal. C, explaining why the circulatory system of the terrestrial snake is different from that of the sea snake. Again, that happens. Uh, terrestrial snakes, and in particular arboreal snakes, need to be vertical far more than sea snakes do, and they need to do so out of water. But the whole passage isn't about that. That's just something that happens in the course of the passage. One thing that happens very often with main idea questions, I may have mentioned this before, is that they will give you correct details from the passage and <clears throat> on the assumption that some people will choose something that actually happens in the passage as the main idea of the passage, when in fact it was just a supporting detail. Uh, answer choice D, pointing out features of the terrestrial snake's cardiovascular system that make it superior to that of the sea snake. And you know, this answer choice sounded so tempting until we got to the word superior. Um, the passage really was getting to the point of showing, hey, look how terrestrial snakes have this thing that's different. It's different, but it's not necessarily superior. Um, in fact, uh, it may well not work out very well for a terrestrial snake to be in the water with that circulatory system. So um, it's not D, because it's not superior. E, explaining how the sea snake is able to neutralize the effects of gravitational pressure on its circulatory system. Hmm. Now, I mean, number one, of course, um, any, any of these answer choices that were purely about the sea snake um, really wouldn't be right. Um, and it certainly doesn't explain how it's able to neutralize the effects. It mentions that these uh, gravitational pressures are counteracted, but we don't really find out how that happens, and it's certainly not the main idea of the passage. So that brings us back to A, which I didn't put a big smiley face on because... Um, you know, while it, the author is interested in explaining adaptations that enable the terrestrial snake to cope with the effects of gravitational pressure on the circulatory system, I don't know that that's immediately obvious from the passage. Um, 
I, I probably personally would have characterized it more as being um, just different adaptations in relating to uh, gravitational pressure on the circulatory system rather than specifying the terrestrial snake. But of the answer choices, this is clearly the only one that captures the overall arc of the passage. So answer choice A it is. Okay, on to a new passage. Finally, done with the snakes. We're on page 370, question number 26. And as before, I will give you a few moments. This one's a relatively short passage, so it'll be, you know, right around four minutes, a little bit less probably. And so go ahead and start. I'll take notes while you read. Okay then, um, I made that a little bit shorter time period because it's a shorter passage and 
I don't think it's super complicated. Let's move on to question number 26. The primary purpose of the passage is to, and so uh, from our notes, we have uh, basically, oops, I forgot to write in the 80s in here. Basically, we have three different eras of um, kind of development strategy, one for the 60s and 70s, one for the 80s, and one for the uh, present um, or the recent time. I mean, the GMAT oftentimes does seem to be, especially in the official guide, um, a lot of questions refer to the late uh, 80s and then the 90s as being relatively recent because, of course, they're using old questions. Uh, from the real GMAT that still illustrate the principles of the current one. Anyway, um, so primary pur purpose of the passage will probably need to include something about looking at uh, different development strategies over time. So choice A, advocate more effective strategies for encouraging the development of high technology enterprises in the United States. So high technology enterprises, that was primarily paragraph two and we don't really hear anything about things being more effective, so it's not A. Um, B, contrast the incentives for economic development offered by local governments with those offered by the private sector. Oh, pff, no, um, we don't, this is all about um, the development strategy of local governments, so uh, private sector is not really in the picture. Um, C, acknowledge and counter adverse criticism of programs being used to stimulate local economic development. There's no uh, well, I, I suppose there, there are adverse criticisms of some of these strategies in um, some of the paragraphs, but the primary purpose is certainly not to do that uh, for everything. And we, and we don't counter the adverse criticism. It talks about the advantages of each and then it, the disadvantages, but then those disadvantages are not countered. Uh, D, define and explore promotional efforts used by local governments to attract new industry. We haven't looked at any promotional efforts. That really only leaves us with E, and so let's double check. Review and evaluate strategies and programs that have been used to stimulate economic development. And that's really what happens. It doesn't mention it quite as specifically. You know, over time is a phrase I think I had used. Your predictions will not always be mirrored in the answer choices word for word. That's okay as long as you have a rough idea of what you're looking for. In this particular case, this still matched the idea of looking at a variety of strategies that uh, local governments do for economic development. So that's good enough for us. It's answer choice E. Okay, question number 27. The passage suggests which of the following about the majority of United States manufacturing industries before the high technology development era of the 1980s. So the question is asking about before the 80s. The 80s are paragraph two, so we really only have to worry about paragraph one, which was the 60s and 70s, which was this attracting manufacturing, which meant attracting it from other towns, taking away from other towns, and adding to your own. Um, so it created jobs, and it was really good, but it was really bad for the people that you took away from. So we need something like that. Into choice A, they lost many of their most innovative personnel to small entrepreneurial enterprises. There's nothing like that. Uh, small entrepreneurial enterprises are the recent development. Um, B, they experienced a major decline in profits during the 60s and 70s. No, uh, there's nothing that suggests that. Um, in fact, it, it sounds like they continued to be successful. It's just not everybody did it because it wasn't working out well as a whole. Um, C, they could provide real economic benefits to the areas in which they were located. Well, that sounds good. We, um, let's see, where does it say that? Yeah, the transfer of jobs and related revenues that resulted from this practice, one town's triumph could become another town's tragedy. Well, if it's one town's triumph, it must have provided real economic benefits. So this actually sounds pretty good. D, um, they employed workers who had no specialized skills. The implication from the high-tech development thing is that, okay, now that there's ultra-high skill workers in this high-technology high development thing, um, which if you wanted to take it to, it to its extreme, said that the people in the, in the manufacturing things do not have those high-tech skills. Um, but it's way too extreme and obviously untrue that, um, that industry uh, hires 
employed workers who had no specialized skills. In fact, a lot of industry requires people who have equally specialized skills, so D, too extreme and also wrong. Um, e, they actively interfered with local entrepreneurial ventures. Again, with the local entrepreneurial ventures. Again, that's the um, paragraph three with the recent innovations. We, do, I mean, there were entrepreneurs prior to, um, or there were entrepreneurs back in the 60s and 70s, but there's nothing about interference or competition, so it's not E. Answer choice C is our correct one. And we'll erase again. Okay, uh, question number 28. The tone of the passage suggests that the author is most optimistic about the economic development potential of which of the following groups. So tone questions ask us to look at the author's overall uh, hints that, uh, of what the author actually believes, what the author thinks is more important, what the author favors, and um, an easy way to look at this, of course, is that there were negative uh, things said about both the attracting the manufacturing, in that you had to take away stuff from other towns, that, and then the high technology development, the problem was that there weren't enough high tech businesses for every town, and it was a relatively small amount of workers in every case, because they had all these technical skills. So both of these have negatives. The author doesn't really have um, negatives for number three, so I, my prediction is that the author is most in favor of the uh, small business development plan. Um, so A, so the author is most optimistic about the economic development potential of A, local governments, Pfft, no. Um, B, high technology promoters, no, we had, we covered that as something the author had um, bad things to say about as well as good. C, local entrepreneurs, that sounds like the third paragraph. D, manufacturing industry managers, again, same reason. Um, and E, economic development strategists who aren't even mentioned in the passage. So based on what we have in the passage, the tone of the passage suggests that the author is most in favor of the local entrepreneurs. Okay. Question number 29. Whoops, I guess I have to erase the page. It's page 371 now. 371. Question number 29. The passage does not state which of the following about local entrepreneurs. So all of this should be in the third paragraph where we find out things about local entrepreneurs. Um, answer choice A, they are found nearly everywhere. Um, well, so uh, this is a little bit of a vocabulary quiz. The word ubiquitous in line 27, small indigenous businesses are created by a nearly ubiquitous resource. Ubiquitous means everywhere, and that is what answer choice A says. So because that is in the passage, that is not the right answer. Be very careful with these not questions because four of the five answer choices will look like things that are right from the passage, and they would be right if the, you were being asked a different question. We're looking for the one that's not stated about uh, local entrepreneurs. Uh, B, they encourage further entrepreneurship. Well, the last three words of the passage are further, or fosters further entrepreneurship, so it's not B either. Um, C, they attract out-of-town investors. I don't see anything about uh, out-of-town investors, so this is looking pretty tempting. Answer choice D, they employ local workers. Um, yeah, we find out about uh, indigenous industry and talent are kept at home, creating an environment that both provides jobs. So that sounds like a local job type thing. So it's not this. And E, they are established in their communities. Um, the line before that says, with roots in their communities, these individuals are less likely to be enticed away by incentives offered by another community. So they are rooted in their communities or established in their communities. So that's not the right answer. And so answer choice C, they, that they attract out-of-town investors, is clearly the thing that doesn't appear in the passage. Last question on economic development history. So 
So question 30. The author of the passage mentions wh uh, which of the following as an advantage of high technology development. High technology development was the second paragraph. And uh, this is a good e example of, I mean, you can see that we haven't been using the notes that much. But it is sometimes useful just to glance over there and say, oh yeah, that was paragraph two. So it's use, the best use of your notes, aside from the act of keeping yourself on track and helping encode things better in your brain, um, the most practical use after that, in terms of things you're most likely to run into, is just when you, when you have more paragraphs, like the one that we had on archaeology, where there were six different paragraphs, remembering where to find certain aspects of the, um, of the passage quickly um, you know, saving yourself a second or two, that's that's the, the benefit. The other two benefits, namely staying on track and fixing it more firmly in your brain, those are the principal benefits of note-taking. Anyway, uh, advantages of high technology development. Does it A, encourage the modernization of existing manufacturing facilities? So, <laughs> This is tricky because, of course, yes, that's probably true, but we're looking for something that the author actually mentions in the passage. There is nothing about um, modernizing um, existing manufacturing facilities in the passage, and so we need something supported by the passage. B, it promotes healthy competition between rival industries. Also, quite possibly true. Your outside knowledge may tell you that that's true. It's not in the passage, so it's not answer choice B. Uh, C, it encourages the growth of related industries. Again, probably true. Probably not in the passage, and therefore definitely not right. No, I mean, there's no probably not. It's not in the passage, so it's not the right answer. Uh, D, it takes full advantage of the existing workforce. This is definitely not true. In fact, um, it doesn't take very good advantage of the workforce because the number of people qualified for these high-tech jobs is very small. That's the disadvantage that it states in the passage, so this is the opposite of what we're after, and wrong. So E, it does not advantage one local workforce at the expense of another. So that is something that it lists in the passage. It says, um, although this approach was preferable to victimizing other geographical areas by taking their jobs, it also had its shortcomings. So it does not create jobs at the expense of another location, which is what we're after. Something mentioned in the passage. Answer choice E. Okay, I think we are going to be able to get through one more passage, so let's do that. So we are on page 372, question number 31. And once again, I'll give you a few minutes to read this one. This one's only two paragraphs, so it's relatively short. And then we have, looks like, five questions. So, um, yeah, get started.
Okay, we'll stop there. And again, if you're watching this later, once these are posted, I guess if you are watching this later, it means these have been posted and you are already in the future. And um, so, you know, hi from the past. And you, uh, you can pause this if you didn't finish reading the passage at that point. So uh, passage briefly then about, about service industries and uh, namely their definition and how workers are classified according to differing definitions of what service uh, entails. So question number 31, the author of the passage is primarily concerned with. So the passage is a lot about these different definitions, so I would figure it's going to be uh, related to that or about the classification of workers. Um, a, discussing research data underlying several definitions. No, we don't get research data. Um, B, arguing for the adoption of a particular definition. Well, there's strengths and weaknesses to every one of the definitions, and the author doesn't really say, well, my definition or the one proposed by these people is the best one, so I think we can rule that out. C, exploring definitions of a concept. That sounds the most tempting, actually. That's what I would have characterized this as. D, comparing the advantages of several definitions. Well, if anything, it's the, um, the disadvantages of these definitions, that they all have kind of ambiguities and weak points. And E, clarifying some ambiguous definitions. Well, the definitions are all ambiguous in their own way, and we don't really get around to clarifying them. So I think we can rule out E as well. So answer choice C, uh, exploring definitions of a concept, sounds pretty good. On to question number 32. In comparing the United States government's definition of services with the classical definition, the author suggests that the classical definition is... Okay, so we do find out that um, when we read about the classical definition, it says the broader classical definition is that a service is an intangible something that cannot be touched or stored. It electric utilities can store energy and computer programmers save information electronically. Thus, the classical definition is hard to sustain. Um, and yeah. So yeah, basically it says that it's uh, it's got some problems. So A, um, is the classical definition more pragmatic? Pragmatic means the same thing as practical. And um, if it's hard to sustain, it's probably not very practical, so it's not A. Uh, B, more difficult to apply. It does say that the definition is hard to sustain, and there's two specific types of uh, businesses and workers that um, that are covered, that, that would we would probably classify, classify as services, um, but um, don't exactly fit. So um, more difficult to apply sounds pretty good. Uh, C, less ambiguous. Well, um, if anything, that's, that's one of the problems is that there's ambiguity in the definition as it applies to real people. So um, the classical definition is not less ambiguous. Uh, D, more widely used. We have nothing about that. And E, more arbitrary. <laughs> well, it, from the sound of it, if anything, I would say that the author thinks that they're all pretty arbitrary um, and all have problems. So the classical definition is probably no more arbitrary. Where, where it is actually more difficult to apply, answer choice B. Uh, last one on this page, number 33. The passage suggests which of the following about service workers in the United States. Um, so passage suggests means it's an inference question. We're going to have to infer something about service workers. And we don't really find out about service workers per se, I think, until really the second paragraph, which is still two thirds of the passage. It doesn't narrow it down that much, but it probably is in the lower two thirds of the passage. So does the passage suggest, A, the number of service workers may be underestimated by the definition of services used by the government? So remember, the government calls anything that's not agriculture or industry services. And so, and the passage actually cites some specific examples of people that might be considered service workers who, because of their industry, or because they work in industry or agriculture, are considered not in service. 
Um, so this actually sounds very true, that the number of service workers may be underestimated by the government's definition. So this sounds good, because some of the ones who we would count as service workers are in one of the other categories. Uh, B, there were fewer service workers than agricultural workers before 1988. Who knows where that came from? That's totally not it. Um, C, this, the number of service workers was almost equal to the number of workers employed in manufacturing until 1988. Um, again, uh, these are both from that opening statement talking about how uh, in 1988 services moved ahead of manufacturing. So, um, you know, B, we, you know, fewer service workers than agricultural workers before 1988, um, almost equal in 1988, uh, before 1988, you know, these are all just extrapolations which with no basis in the passage, all based off of the opening sentence alone. Um, D, most service workers are employed in service occupations rather than in service industries. Um, well, the, the government definition, the passage does say that um, the definition fails to recognize the distinction between service industries and service um, occupations, but there's nothing that says that there's more in one or than, than the other. And then E, most service workers are employed in occupations where they provide services that do not fall under the classical definition of services. And that's totally not supported by the passage either. So we're left with A, um, which is a, really an inference that we can make. The, the passage basically almost says, hey, there's some people that are listed under agriculture or industry who probably, in, another, in a, a less broad definition, would probably be considered under the service heading. So answer choice A, it is. All right, on to page 373. Question number 34. The author of the passage mentions which of the following as one disadvantage of the United States government's definition of services. Um, And of course, one of them actually we just mentioned, this definition fails to recognize the distinction between service industries and service occupations. It also mentions that many service workers employed by manufacturers would fall under the industrial rather than the services category. So those are two disadvantages that the author mentions. Let's look for one of those in the answer choices. Um, A, it is less useful than, other de than the other definitions mentioned in the passage. The author totally does not say that. Um, it is narrower in scope than the other definitions mentioned in the passage. Well, if your definition is everything in category C is is every is anything that's not in A or B, that's not really a narrower definition. That's it sounds like it basically is services is the catch-all um, summary none of the above category. It's not industry, it's not agriculture, must be services. That's definitely not a narrow definition. So it's not B. Uh, it is based on the final product produced rather than on the type of work performed. Um, and that's actually something that the passage uh, says in line 21. It categorizes workers based on their company's final product rather than on the actual work the employees perform. So that's pretty much exactly it. We'll double check the other answers though, just to be sure. It does not recognize the diversity of occupations within the service industries. The passage doesn't say that and it misclassifies many workers who are employed in service industries. So this one probably ought to tempt you a little bit because it sounds like something that happens in the passage, but it's in fact the other way around. Um, it misclassifies many workers who are employed in industry or agriculture. Remember that those are people who are doing service work, but because they work in a manufacturing, uh, like the, because they work in, in agriculture or in industry, they're considered agricultural or industrial workers rather than service workers, even though they're doing service work. So it's actually the reverse that um, the people outside of the service category are being misclassified. Everyone who's in service, well, that might be an assumption too, but the bulk of the misclassification according to the passage is the reverse. So it's not answer choice E. And it is answer choice C. Okay, one more. One more, 
one more question and then we will call it a day. Question number 35. The author refers to service workers employed by manufacturers in line 23 primarily in order to point out, and so we go back and double check to see what that was, um, thus the many service workers employed by manufacturers, book bookkeepers or janitors for example, would fall under the industrial rather than the services category. So he uses it, he or she uses this as to point out um, the way in which uh, some of these workers get misclassified. So we're going to want something along, along those lines. Uh, a, is that a type of worker not covered by the United States government's system of classifying occupations? Well, th they are covered. I mean, they are classified. Those people would be classified as industrial rather than services. So they are covered. It's not A. They're covered in the wrong place, but they're, but they're covered. Uh, B, a flaw in the United States government's definition of services. So on the assumption that a misclassification is a flaw or that a especially a prevalent misclassification is a flaw. That sounds pretty good. We'll save that one. Um, is it a factor that has influenced the growth of the service economy in the United States? No way. Um, D, a type of worker who is classified on the basis of work performed rather than on the basis of the company's final product. This is again the other way around. These are people who are doing service work who are not considered service workers because of the um, the company's final product, rather than, for example, someone who um, would be put in the service industry just because they worked for a, um, a service company. So this is an example of someone who probably ought to be in the services category who is instead an industrial. So D is the opposite. And E, the diversity of the workers who are referred to as service workers. No, we don't hear about that. So answer choice B, that that is a flaw that there are these people put in the wrong category. Okay, that's a good place to stop. I think we got to the end of a passage. Um, I don't remember how many I said I was supposed I was I was going to get get through today, but that really does seem like a logical stopping point. The next thing would be giving you time to read the passage about feminist theory, and then there are at least six questions, and I really think that that will be something better covered after the break. Uh, so this is the last session until the 27th, I believe. This is probably extra information for those of, who, those of you who are watching this late. But um, there are some of those holidays coming up, and I will be out of town. So uh, the broadcast will resume in three days. And over that time, if you're doing your studying, don't study too hard. If you're not studying, take a well-deserved break. You've been watching Brockett's OGTV, the GMAT edition. My name's Jim Jacobson, like it says there. And we're going through the 12th edition of the guide, page by page, cover to cover, question by question. And uh, hopefully giving you some question, not only the answers, but also some insight into how to go about them. So I'll see you next time.